21 of Bitcoin Hard Talk. This is where we discuss hard talk about hard money. I spent the last two decades of my life dedicated and geeking out to the subject of Bitcoin investing and money. And today we're going to be doing the usual show where we do two halves. The first half, I'm going to be giving you all the updates this week in Bitcoin, macro and geopolitics. And then finally, in the second half, I'm going to be sharing what I believe to be driving the Bitcoin price at the moment and why I think now we're in cycle four, that it is going to be a different type of narrative that drives the four year cycle. Now we are moving into halving. So all of that today. Um, so I'm just going to jump straight in. Just before I jump in, do me a favor, hit the like button and share this with anybody that you think needs to build and protect their wealth and protect themselves from all the craziness that's happening in the world around us today. So let's jump straight in with the content. So the beginning in Bitcoin, we passed $50,000. So we have been $50,000 before. It was a few years back, but we've only actually spent a total of 144 days um, on above the, you know, above 50K as well. Sorry, just messing around with uh, my phones. We had a little bit of a delay going live today because uh, uh, we had a little glitch in the equipment, but uh, we carry on. So 144 days um, in its entire history have we spent above 50K. Um, not, you know, financial advice, not price advice. I never really talk about price. You know me. I'm a Bitcoin thinker rather than a fiat thinker. A Bitcoin thinker means that I love it when prices go down because I get to buy more Bitcoin with my fiat. The lower the price of Bitcoin, the more Bitcoin I can accumulate with my fiat, which exits me further from whatever I earned that month in fiat savings into Bitcoin savings. So I love it when the price goes down. However, the sentiment of Bitcoin is when the four year cycle plays out and more and more people join it. So 144 days, we've been above 40,000, uh, 50,000 rather. If this is your first time, welcome. We are up 122% on the year. This is very normal for Bitcoin. Of all the 14, 15 years, um, we have historically outperformed every asset class in history. And every single year, someone says, it's too late. Have I missed the boat? I've been hearing that every single year of every single month of every single day since I've been involved in Bitcoin. When it pumped to $10, everyone was saying it's too late. I missed the boat. When it pumped to $100, they said it's too late. I missed the boat. When it pumped to $1,000, they said it's too late. I missed the boat. When it pumped to $69,000, they said it's too late. I have missed the boat. And now it pumps to 50000 Many will be saying it's too late. I've missed the boat. I got to find something, the next Bitcoin killer. And every single year they keep trading and trying to find the next Bitcoin killer and nothing kills Bitcoin because it is 100% unique for the property of digital hard sound money. But we're starting to see a really interesting trend right now with the Bitcoin ETF. So now everybody can buy Bitcoin through their traditional accounts by buying a stock. It's not the same as Bitcoin but it's backed by Bitcoin. You know, if you understand the real value of Bitcoin uh, with the proof of work network that I'll be always been sharing, then you like to have Bitcoin without a share in the middle. But many people like to have a share in the middle just for simplicity. But since the ETF launched earlier this year in January, just this time last month, approximately, for every $100 million of inflows, that means when people are selling the Bitcoin ETF. There's about 11 of them right now. Uh, more of them are coming to market. But everyone that sells the Bitcoin ETF, that means that means that they have to sell some Bitcoin to back it and it's some outflow. But everyone that buys the Bitcoin ETF or, or across the all 11 ETFs, it creates inflow. And what we've noticed so far in the limited history that we've had, so don't read too much into it, but for every $100 million of net inflow, the Bitcoin ETF pumps about $290. So that means if we get, you know, um, 10, yeah, 100 million or we get a billion dollars of net inflow, then we get 2,900 added to the Bitcoin price so far. 
we are approaching, you know, last week, uh, we had one day where there was $680 million of net inflow. So you can see that the Bitcoin ETF is directly having its impact. Now, where it's interesting, and we'll be covering this more when I go through the three things that are driving Bitcoin price, is that it's only just begun. And I'll share a little bit more about that. Now, in approximately 59 days from today, the four-year Bitcoin halving happens. That's an event that happens every approximate four years. It's based upon the number of blocks that were mined, and it was built into the code from day one. This is why Bitcoin is digital hard sound money, because it has a set supply of 21 million, about 19 and a half million of them have already been mined by miners. And then we have about a million and a half less to mine. And then the miners just receive transaction fees. But in every four years, the number of Bitcoins, so what happens is it packages all the transactions up, puts them into a block, and every 10 minutes it mines that block. If it's taking longer than 10 minutes, there's this thing called a difficulty rate adjustment which makes it harder for people to mine and you've got to be more and more competitive. And it's a very, very efficient market. It is, in fact, one of the pure free market economics I know in terms of pure adjustment um, in the Bitcoin mining proof of work industry. But every four years, the number of Bitcoins that get created and given to miners every 10 minutes, think of that as a scenery in traditional finance, um, it halves. Now, in 59 days, we have the halving. That doesn't normally impact price right away because it's factored into the short-term traders that understand that. But every four-year cycle, it drives the trend, which if you look at a Bitcoin chart, everyone thinks it's volatile. But really, if you put it out, change it to a logarithmic chart, you'll just see this growth, 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 growth in a bull market for 14 years with a bit of wild volatility in between that you can smooth out by looking at the longer trend. And that's what I've always been doing, helping people think in Bitcoin so that it eats away at their fiat, um, which has historically worked very well, not financial advice, not saying it's going to work into the future. But I am betting on hard money because I don't like betting on soft money. And so at the same time, um, for every, we're, we're starting to see the ETH price, which is essentially a different narrative because it's switched from proof of work to proof of stake, and it's becoming a layer for stable coins. And in the future, maybe central bank digital currencies and also decentralized finance. So rather than having centralized companies in the middle, um, you have that. Now, ETH is very, very different from Bitcoin. The economics are completely different. It has a founder. It had a pre-mine and it's a much, much higher risk version, but it has a different type of model, which is proof of stake. Now that hits 2.8K because it shares all the transaction fees. So as more people launch stable coins where you can send digital fiat around the world without a party in the middle, um, then that incurs a transaction fee and those transaction fees are shared with those that are running validators. And personally, I use ETH staking in order to generate more Bitcoin. So I stake my ETH on 3Bank to the Future, uh, the company that I co-founded, and then I receive some ETH returns. I convert those into Bitcoin and it's a higher risk leverage play of accumulating Bitcoin for me. Um, I'll go through a bit of more about that in future episodes, but ETH passed 2.8K as Bitcoin passed 51K as well. Um, at the same time, ETH staking validator Q went up. What does that mean? So when you stake your ETH, based upon how many people are looking to stake, it takes longer in the queue. It's gone from about under 24 hours to over three days. That means that it's a sign that more people are looking to queue. At the same time, one of the largest fund managers in the world, Frank, uh, Frank Templeton, they applied for their ETH ETF, which is like a fund that then gives people the additional ETH from staking. But this is a very, very different structure to Bitcoin. This is why ETH is so different. With Bitcoin, just because the ETF, the fund, owns a bunch of Bitcoin, it doesn't mean that they gain control over the mining network and the nodes that validate every transaction. With ETH staking, it's different. They actually get to control the network. So I'm sure banks are going to want to control those networks into the future, especially as we transition to a world of Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies. And ETH is one of those plays in that transition, 
that sucks up into Bitcoin. And I'll share what's driving price at the moment. So staking is going a lot further. In other Bitcoin news, we always cover the fraud cases that happened in the crazy market of 2017 when we had the ICO boom and bust cycle and 2022 when we had the, the you know the leveraging cycle where everyone created fake uh, crypto banks and recreated our Lehman Brothers of crypto moment and they're suffering right now. So the New York Attorney General has now put to press charges against Digital Currency Group. Digital Currency Group was a mammoth company in our industry. Before the ETFs, they had a financial product called GBTC, which allowed people to get exposure to Bitcoin through the stock market. And it had subsidiaries that was lending out Bitcoin. I mean, it had exchanges like Gemini and Genesis. And then it had partnership with uh, companies like the Winklevoss twins that built on top of it. And they got themselves in a lot of trouble because the whole thing blew up when excessive leverage was being taken by hedge funds like Three Arrows Capital, Alameda Capital, that were borrowing funds from crypto lending platforms that were creating fake yield and Ponzi schemes like Celsius and FTX, uh, and sorry, um, um, BlockFi and various others. Okay, so that has now hit its head. Um, Letitia James, who is you know, went after Mishinsky, for example, from Celsius and SBF from FTX, all the big fraudsters and Do Kwon from Terra Luna is now coming off the digital currency group and increased it from a $1.1 billion fraud to a $3 billion fraud. So now catching up with the size of Celsius in terms of the charges. At the same time, uh, CZ from Binance, who is an exchange that really is not favored by the US system, um, he is now, his case was due to be in February this month. Um, he's facing up to, well, 18 months in prison. He settled, the company settled about $4.7 billion. He settled $150 million, but his case um, has moved over to April. He's suffering from less charges as a result of the the, the others like um, Celsius and Mishinsky. Okay, so that is the update in this week in Bitcoin. Now let's go to this week in macro. So um, we're starting to see more and more tensions and escalations in the whole Red Sea corridor and the Suez Canal uh, between Egypt, Yemen, you know, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. As we get more and more escalations in the Palestinian cause, um, the Houthis from Yemen, they're doing more and more escalation there. UK and US retaliated by funding, by printing off some more USD and GBBP in the previous two largest proof of weapons networks. Um, the proof of weapons networks, if you've heard my previous broadcast, I call it that because fiat currency is essentially backed by military might and, um, and you being able to exercise your influence over country. So UK and US, the previous two empires, the current empire, um, they are attacking and blowing up people in Yemen. Great humanitarian crisis where the Houthis are currently essentially the recognized military in that country. Um, and that's creating carnage because the Houthis, they're equivalent of a financial sanction, whereas the US uh, proof of weapons network controls SWIFT. And SWIFT is the way the settlement layer, that's how they exercised influence over Putin, for example. Um, and uh, so the equivalent in the world where you don't control the SWIFT network is some of the economic sanctions by attacking ships and making you know, inflation through making those ships and shipments, insurance costs go through the roof and making them go their costs go up because they have to go around Africa in order to get to the same place. Um, rather than those corridors being pursued. Um, and so they now consider that a, a reason to blow uh, people up when they're engaging in sanctions. And so that is starting to hit inflation. As a result, the Federal Reserve was very confident that the consumer price index and including the market was set to be about 2.9%. Uh, so they were thinking that inflation is um, set to come down. The previous CPI, Consumer Price Index, which is a really bad measure of inflation, the better is the Producer Price Index, and then you have Trueflation that takes out how you know all the manipulation from governments. 
but the previous one was about 3.4%. Uh, this one was set to come down to 2.9%, but it was worse than expected. And just so you know, markets shift, not when things are as expected, but when they're worse or better than expected. When they're better than expected, you get a pump. When it's worse than expected, you get a correction. And we started to see a correction in the stock markets accordingly because it came in at 3.1%. This means that inflation is returning at a greater rate or it's not decreasing at the rate that they would like it to. So I was talking about consumer price index um, and inflation came in worse than expected. All right, so consumer price index coming in worse than expected and therefore inflation is still a thing. That is a very bad thing during the election cycle. For those of you that don't know, central banks are meant to be independent of politics, which means that you're meant to not have, you're not meant to have a fiscal and monetary union. Fiscal policy is where the government sets its agenda and it always wants to spend more so that it can get more votes to satisfy more people. But there's this bogey called inflation that comes along, which essentially takes all the wealth from the same people that were demanding all the money that think the money is an in infinite supply because we are running fiat currency Ponzi schemes. And so when you're hit 34 trillion of debt in the US, the existing empire or above, People just don't care anymore and you just keep going because the reality is there is no return. When you are at the stage where you are exponentially printing money and you're taking on more and more debt and you have to pay higher interest rates, then inflation is always the result. And they try to manipulate markets by pushing down rates so that they can get everyone to be happy again and start investing in the stock markets because they do not believe in free markets anymore. Free markets are not what we have in the United States and UK. We have markets that say stock markets are not allowed to crash. And so therefore, we will always choose inflation and we will hide that. And we will make sure that there is a continued wealth inequality, which is a trend that you see at the end of a fiat currency debt cycle. OK, so that means that you move away from free markets. Now, that has implications on both the election cycle and also the markets and the Bitcoin cycle. And so obviously there is in the geopolitical side, it's all about in the US trying to get more and more money for genocide, for uh, fighting against Putin um, and giving that money to Ukraine and also supporting Taiwan in order to not reunify with China as it's because it's a geopolitically strategic. While China is going around the world geopolitically right now and trying to use diplomacy and fund infrastructure growth, people are growing more skeptical about the US dollar economic hitmen at the IMF. And so therefore it is having allies and enemies. And that creates and hyper accelerates when you have wealth inequality, extreme left and right, and also this bi, you know, bipolar geopolitical world that we are moving to at the moment away from one superpower over to more than one power. So um, what happened this week in the geopolitical side? Well, during the Super Bowl, um, Israel decided that was the time to invade Rafa. And Rafa is the corner of Palestine that they chucked and squeezed 1.5 million refugees into and said, this is the safe zone. Israel decided, let's go in, let's blow it up. Um, and they started to uh, do that entry during the Super Bowl. At the very same time, Biden thought it would be funny, or whoever works in his social media department, to release a cryptic tweet with laser eyes. Laser eyes are the Bitcoin symbol. So the Bitcoin community was saying, Biden's going Bitcoin. Um, the people in Palestine were saying, um, is this some kind of secret plan and traumatize us at the same time as Israel's committing a genocide on the Palestinian people during Super Bowl? Um, you know, it's incredibly tasteless, but he released that photo during the Super Bowl and Israel decided to take that opportunity to say, I take those laser eyes as the plan and to go ahead to invade Rafa and do civilian bombing and invade the final um, hospitals, which has led to horrific drafts and more war crimes. But 
Rafa is strategically important in the geopolitical side because it is on the border of Egypt. Now, Egypt and Israel had peace treaties in the past, but they said they have a red line. So the rest of the Arab leagues, which is the, you know, the groups of different nations um, that have historically worked together in the past, but have had to choose sides as the Palestinian cause kind of goes in the middle. You have Israel siding with the United States and Saudi Arabia. And then you have Iran, which is putting together a resistance movement through Yemen um, and some of these failed states like Syria. Um, and so US and UK have historically got involved. And um, Iraq was kind of the one that spread the two and caused the carnage. Um, and so, but the Egypt has historically shared intelligence with Israel, but they have a red line border. They said, if you invade Rafa, we're going to tear up the peace agreement. Turns out that they didn't do that at all. But what we have seen is that they are building refugee camps in Egypt, which signifies exactly what I said when I very first started these conversations around following the money. The goal is to ethnically cleanse and push out the Palestinian people into the Sinai Desert in Israel. Um, uh, sorry, in Israel, in Egypt, uh, Freudian slip there, in Egypt to expand the size of Israel. And then once you have done that, you then can um, have the fact that that will lead to tensions between Egypt and Israel. And you can continue the expansion, continue the expansion as they have conferences right now where the Israeli people are looking to actually um, occupy Gaza and build their new settlements and their land. Um, now, Egypt has a major, major geopolitical problem. They are surrounded not just by, you know, the Palestine border and the geopolitical issues with Israel, but they were also surrounded by Libya, which has its own refugee crisis as a result of some of the other proof of weapon network escalations um, that involved Israel and US and the humanitarian crisis that resulted. And now Sudan, which is like over 7 million refugees that are going through their own humanitarian crisis. So they're receiving at every border, at every corner, refugees that might want to be pushed into Egypt. And at the same time, if you expel the Palestinian people from their land, that brings the resistance movement into the Sinai Desert, which means that Egypt and Israel are in direct conflict and in breach of their peace agreements. So Palestine um, is essentially these uh, Israel is just pushing and pushing forward. But also Egypt, remember, just like Ukraine, is one of the larger indebted nations to the economic hitman at the International Monetary Fund, whose job is to get the world addicted to dollars so that then people can have negotiated tied loans. You borrow dollars, you need to repay in dollars. And if you don't have enough dollars, they destroy their economy by printing their own local currency, converting them in the FX market to meet their dollar obligations, and those dollars all end up back in America. Now, because America has the world reserve currency, as long as people are willing to buy their debt, you end up with all the debt in the crippled country that took the IMF loan, and then they create hyperinflation through their own currency and complete dollar de dependency until all of those dollar reserves disappear and you get political unrest like you're seeing in countries like Sri Lanka and Pakistan and Egypt and Libya um, and, uh, and um, uh, Lebanon um, and various other countries and Turkey as well as their dollar, de um, as their dollar reserves deplete. But those agreements are also tied loans. So they have to spend all the money back in America on the military industrial complex. And you have geopolitical tension when Russia on its proof of weapons network is competing to um, you know, create military equipment for other countries. And they can either take it from America, Iran or um, Russia. And then a bunch of countries say, we're the good people, they're the bad people, in order to fund their military industrial complex and become the backing of the proof of weapons network, which becomes a world reserve currency. The whole thing crumbles 
when the 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 cost of servicing the debt becomes unprofitable to the colonial expansion and foreign policy in the American empire. In the British empire, it was colonial expansion. In the American empire, it was foreign policy. Um, and in the Russian empire, I guess you could call it that, it's starting to hit that, that tension stage. Um, because if you watched last week's, we covered nuclear warfare and how that use really uh, leads to um, the backing of those fiat currency proof of weapons network. But because Egypt now has these multiple refugee crises and escalation, that is really bad for business, really bad for the economy, and really bad for servicing their IMF debt. And so obviously diplomacy is looking to be chosen. And so Israel is, is fulfilling its goal to expand and push the Palestinians out into Egypt. And there's footage being shown of them actually um, creating that uh, those uh, refugee camps. So the ethnic cleansing and the genocide of the Palestinians is in full mode, which creating the geopolitical situation um, that we are in and we are experiencing right now. Um, and so if you want to research more, there were things called the Camp David Accords, um, uh, which led to uh, some of those situations. Um, I'm just going to press a, a button on my technology. We're having all the lovely technology things today and uh, make sure my screen is up. OK. Um, as I said, so, you know, the $18 billion of IMF debt could be something. Remember, in the very, very early videos where I covered who owns Israel, I was talking about pushing out to Egypt, renegotiating the $18 billion. So I'll be following the money there in order to try and continue because that has served. That got me about four months ahead of what actually ended up happening. But there is a very different, different type of uh, tension and situation that arises from this. So because Egypt is kind of in the middle, they choose diplomacy, they historically have used military might for their proof of weapons network. They don't use what Iran uses, which is more of a militia, you know, militaries that are in, um, you know, unelected um, militaries that are, um, that are around the different regions. And so there's a bit of a different, you know, different way of organizing between Egypt and Iran. Um, but the diplomacy between Iran, Saudi Arabia and Egypt is the only way to really progress that so that we don't get this ongoing escalation that we're seeing. And so Egypt has really got caught, got caught in the middle of that. And economically, it's just starting to get a little bit of a turnaround, but it's still got excessive dollar debt that has led to its issues as well at the moment. Um, so, uh, and another part of the tension as well is that Egypt used to get its weapons from Russia to back its uh, military, uh, but now it goes more down the US route and Israel has its own technology AI driven military industrial complex where they're essentially selling genocide as a service and occupation as a service and all of the occupation technology that they've been selling to some of the worst regimes around the world that gave them about 12 and a half billion dollars of revenue last year that they were hoping to expand and they're beta testing through their colonial expansion at the moment. So this really hits into some interesting geopolitical meetings that have happened right now. So is Egypt going to choose kind of the NATO corridor? Remember, Turkey is in NATO and Turkey and Egypt have had a meeting uh, for the first time in like 12 years. Are they going to follow the NATO path or are they going to go with the BRICS path, which is Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt? They're now in BRICS. Um, and uh, that is accelerated by the military industrial complex of Russia, um, accelerated by the diplomacy of China, um, which is creating these alternative corridors. And so really this comes down to the whole BRICS, NATO type of geopolitical tension, global south, global north, which is really starting to escalate in terms of narratives right now. So are, is Egypt going to favor the Israel peace deal, um, you know, at Camp David, or is it going to be a bit more of a return to the Arab League where Saudi Arabia, Iran, they kind of normalize and they end up on the BRICS network, um, which is kind of supercharged Arab League based upon Russia and China. So this is kind of 
you know, the the whether if you get that, you'll get a two state solution. At the moment, Israel is saying we don't want a Palestinian state. We want complete ethnic cleansing. We want um, to commit genocide and we want to get rid of, um, you know, Palestine altogether. And so really, this gets the tension with the resistance movements that are saying we won't allow that to happen. And that's the tension that we're experiencing right now. Um, and so at the moment, does, you know, the, at the end of the day, what they want, does UK and, e and US exit? That's when you know that you're getting de-escalation. Otherwise, we're going for further, further escalation, which, as you know, when I covered the Great Depression of the 2020s video series, which if you haven't watched that, by the way, um, go to simondixon.com, create yourself a login to the membership portal. And that not only gives you access to the post webinars, we're going to be doing an AMA live webinar after this, but it also gives you access to all the Bitcoin hard talk episodes, a free digital copy of my book, the first book to ever publish um, about Bitcoin that was ever published that included Bitcoin and this transition to central bank digital currencies. Uh, but also we'll make sure that you get um, access to the live AMA webinars. We did our first one last week. But, you know, um, that really... Uh, so watch the Great Depression of the 2020s video series because I was talking about how we enter into continued military escalation this decade and then we end up in a monetary renegotiation. And in future episodes, we'll cover because there is a lot of development that is happening on the oppressive central bank digital currencies and these different BRICS superpower charged Arab leagues that we're starting to see. And we will see what comes next. At the same time, Iran and Qatar, uh, they met together. They had a meeting and U.S. decided to have a meeting with Jordan. Uh, Biden was on complete opposite uh, pass to the Jordanian leaders uh, because the so much of Jordan is from the previous ethnic cleansing that Israel did when they um, they ethnically cleanse uh, millions of refugees over into Jordan in order to expand um, their goals. And so that is essentially what we're seeing right now. At the same time, remember I talked about we have even seen um, what they call the establishment in Pakistan. Um, they have actually started to put their democratically elected leader into prison. Um, and so we're starting to see real geopolitical tensions, which also coincided with the record levels of IMF debt and dollar depletion. So when you have control, when U.S. takes control through IMF economic hitman loans, you end up having political control through tied loans, where those loans are connected to implementing their ideology of how you should be running your economy and who you should be buying weapons to back the fiat currency proof of weapons network. And this went to the extreme of Imran Khan being, you know, literally put in prison for 10 years as it had its military you know, uh, kind of coups and politics inside. Don't want to go too deep into that one. Um, but, you know, the establishment um, trying to take over. And while he's in prison, his party actually started to win some of the elections as well. And obviously Imran Khan was a very anti-Zionist, talking about the Palestinian cause. Um, and uh, that started to create some of that carnage. Now, in November, they applied to join the BRICS corridor. Um, and so if Pakistan started to give, te you know, started to look like all of our dollar reserves are disappearing, then U.S. can either interfere with politics or they can default on their debt because or they can hyperinflate their currency, which causes inflation. But as their dollar reserves deplete and they can't service the IMF debt, they may need to do a monetary renegotiation, which is where they start looking at BRICS and Belt and Road initiatives. And so you start to see how these different things become life or death um, when the establishment tries to take the elected officials and you have complete political turmoil and, a reset, and, a, and, a rest, <laughs> and unrest as a result. So, you know, the BRICS negotiations, the entry was happening at the same time as their dollar reserves depleting. 
Um, and so also we had uh, Egypt and Turkey. They met for the first time as well. That's kind of an, a NATO style, you know, NATO force there, as well as these BRICs. So, you know, they haven't met for 12 years um, in terms of some of the tensions that they had from previous proof of weapons um, networks. And finally, in the geopolitical side, we started to see a lot of what could either be a genuine threat or genuine propaganda but normally you get these types of things that happen at these escalating times. So you started to see U.S. intelligence put out there that there is intelligence, that there is these weapons of mass destruction, satellite types of things. Um, for those of you that know the Proof of Weapons Network better will understand that um, by Putin putting them up in space. And so this is being led to believe that this is a massive escalation or political you know um geopolitical threat security threat which is normally what comes before that also um in terms of the putin regime um the resistance movement against uh, him was uh you know um alexi um let me make sure i get the name right uh um navali uh sorry to get the name wrong he sadly passed away in prison today um, due to and obviously us is going to make a really big deal about that um, but he was very popular and very responsible for um, exposing many of the atrocities in terms of the russian proof of weapons network and i um, always applaud anybody that stands up against oppression by their governments um, and so which is what i always uh, ask everybody to do which is patriotism sometimes gets in the way of you calling out your governments. And so if you, every government engages in different degrees of terrorism, um, but sometimes they call it defense. Um, and so you just get to call it defense or terrorism, depending on which side you are, which was really the birth of the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement was if you can create a state, then you can call terrorism, which was the Huguenot original foundation of the IDF, get the British troops to convert them into the IDF. And when you have a state, you can now call it defense when you're committing terrorism. That's also the same thing that ISIS tries to do. It's why it wants to take over Syria um, and Iraq so that it can then do exactly what the Zionist movement do does. Rather than call it terrorism, call it defense. And uh, we get to call it defense. And then some countries don't do it on their own ground, but US and UK commit it in Yemen and Syria and various other things. And so they get to call it defense or just point blank ignore it when people don't care about when it's happening in their country. So we're starting to see this real, you know, uh, Tucker Carlson interview Putin, give his narrative. And then we had the U.S. narrative that's leading to these fear driven types of events that normally leads to either real genuine threats or false flags. Either way, the proof of weapons network is continuing to escalate on the geo political side and so um that is what we are starting to see right now now with that in mind with the updates in the bitcoin market the update in the macro market and the update in the geopolitical market how does that lead to what might happen to bitcoin next and so this brings me to the second half now if you would like me to cover um, the three types of forces that relate to all of those that is going that I think is causing the Bitcoin pump and what will continue through the four year cycle, then do me a favor, hit the like button, hit the uh, subscribe button, hit the bell symbol, hit all. We're trying to get to 100,000 subscribers. Um, we're in 91,000 or 92,000 right about now. Uh, help me get that to the next stage and I will continue to give content. So. What is creating the price at the moment? What, are, what is causing a pump in the price at the moment? Well, firstly, it's just the normal four-year cycle. But there are three narratives, as it were, um, that is driving what I believe to be the growth in the price of the Bitcoin market right now. The first is the one that we've always had, that I've been sharing with the world ever since I first bought my first Bitcoin at $3 and published the first published book in the world that got many, many people into Bitcoin and created financial products at Bank to the Future that allowed everyone to get exposure to the growth of this market, um, which turned out to be the highest performing um, market in history. 
Well, the normal narratives is, you know, I've always talked about in banking, when you deposit your money at a bank, the bank becomes the legal owner of your money. When they become the legal owner of your money, they can spend it as they choose. And because they can spend it as they choose, they get to create new digital currency every time they issue a loan, which is a Ponzi scheme that requires more and more debt, which causes inflation and the business cycle. You know, the opposite of Austrian economics built upon hard money. You have Keynesian economics built upon soft money and ever increasing levels of debt. So what is driving Bitcoin at the moment? Well, it's the normal self-custody narrative, which is that people buy Bitcoin at the, you know, at the inverse of fiat currency issues. And so um, we are seeing three narratives. One is the self-custody, one is the equity side, and one is the debt side. I'm going to go through each of those at the moment. Um, but essentially, think of the opposite of fiat currency. Bitcoin is money you can own. When do you want to own your money? When do you have little trust for digital currency created at a bank that is backed by debt? Well, it's when there is excessive debt levels. Those that understand the geopolitical, you know that the banking system is a Ponzi scheme. And so therefore, you want to own your own money. Also, when do you want it? Well, if you've experienced things like pandemics, when you're locked in your home and you can't actually access certain hard assets like gold, and therefore you start to value being able to own your own money with no intermediary in the middle. What about war and political tensions? Well, when no one trusts each other's fiat currency, they clear in hard money. And so therefore the demand for hard money um, goes up as well. And what about bank crisis? Well, we still have the second half of the 2023 bank run crisis when the Fed repackaged those loans and had $680 billion of bad debt on the bank's balance sheet. And those term loans end in March. So that creates the same because they rolled over the problem with the cause of the problem. You ever tried to solve a debt issue with more debt? How does that work out? Called a Ponzi scheme. We all know it never works. But fiat currency, do it every 100 years and try and pull it off. And uh, in previous broadcasts, I've talked about every 27 years is the average life cycle of a fiat currency Ponzi scheme. So that is the whole money you can own understanding. Money you can spend. When it becomes central bank digital currencies, you start to get censorship and more and more censorship within your money. You start to have more aggressive anti-money laundering laws as people put new bills out because they're saying you need to be scared of the terrorists. And so because of that, you get more and more aggressive, harder ways to access your money. And as your wealth builds, if you have been in the Bitcoin world, then as you go into fiat, you end up with more and more aggressive AML policies, harder to spend your money, um, and central bank digital currencies codify that into the future. So money you can own, money you can spend is the self-custody. Because with Bitcoin, you can spend it person to person. You create an immutable record of it, so it's not a good idea to commit crimes with it. Um, however, if you want to send large value, I just received my claim, which was a multi-million dollar claim from funds that I had on the Celsius, because I thought it would be a good idea to borrow against some of my Bitcoin rather than sell it. Turns out that that was a Ponzi scheme, and uh, I was entitled to withdraw it. I was able to withdraw $10 million in crypto with the click as easy as sending an email as a result. I don't normally talk numbers, but because it was involved in a bankruptcy, this is all public information. So they publish, when you're involved in one of these, all of the information about your personal finances as well. So that's why I'm more willing to talk about it when I wouldn't normally talk about it. Now, thankfully, that's a small amount of my Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, you know, the way I manage my finance, but those types of peer to peer monetary transactions, it would have been impossible. Some people right now, they couldn't get support with Coinbase and they're going to receive a dollar check in the post. And that check has to be cashed within three months. And if it's not cashed within three months, because they come from a country that won't even allow you to support a dollar check, you realize why soon this is all going to be done by central bank digital currencies. It's inevitable, it's predictable, it's guaranteed. It's a massive infringement upon your freedoms with digital IDs. 
and your ESG scores and your social credit scores and your terrorist scores and everything that's going to come through based upon your pattern of um, how you spend. But it's all coming and we protect ourselves from it. Um, and the final narrative with Bitcoin, money you can own, money you can spend and money that has a fixed supply. When do you care about money that has a fixed supply? <laughs> When the money printers of the proof of weapons networks are cranking out like crazy in order to send $61 billion to Ukraine, in order to send $17.5 billion to Israel, in order to send $10 billion to Taiwan, in order to spend another $10 billion per, you know, um, with the humanitarian crisis because of the proof of weapons that you made, you then sell some humanitarian crisis aid to the countries when you could have just stopped blowing them up in the first place, but you also benefit from that and you negotiate um, your, your way through those humanitarian aids as well. Um, and so that then starts to pump stock markets, obviously. And so as more and more military industrial complexes um, is uh, prevailing, uh, they can start to, those has a, a good impact on the countries that benefit from war, the company, sorry, the benefit from war. And if you can continue to print and people will continue to buy your Ponzi scheme debt, then people can borrow against their stocks through the central bank, get access to cheap credit if you're a large company, and then buy back your stock in order to pump the market. They put down interest rates in order to encourage everybody to borrow more. And if they borrow more, they create more digital currency through the banking system, through their mortgages, which increases the real estate, which creates that wealth inequality between those that have assets and those that don't have assets. And that just gets further and further apart as people start to supplement debts. This then creates more demand for exchange traded funds. Those exchange traded funds now have an allocation into Bitcoin. Bitcoin is backed by hard money that increases the value of the hard money that comes in through the stock market. So you have the geopolitical tension that creates the demands for self-custody of you owning Bitcoin the way that it was designed at the same time as the proof of weapons network ranking out stock market products based upon their Ponzi scheme, which creates more demand for ETF. That creates a wealth effect and people start to allocate a percentage to the uncorrelated asset, which is Bitcoin. As interest rates start to come down because people want to win elections, because fiscal policy is no longer independent of monetary policy, and you move more and more to a central bank digital currency, where you essentially combine monetary and fiscal policy through code, um, then you end up having being able to manipulate for political gains. So during political cycles, you put those interest rates down. But when you put those interest rates down, you get this bogey called inflation and they are continually juggling the time bomb. But the central bank ends up with more and more products that come as the banks start to blow up as a result of those interference in the market. Now, then you have the debt markets. How do the debt markets work? Well, you get to the government gets to issue more and more debt and it needs new markets into in order to sell that debt too. Who's the next market to sell that debt? Well, pensioners are maxed out. They're going for a bit of ETF correlation. So now the stock market is driving money into Bitcoin. And so you're getting these flows. And why is there a delay and a continual flow right now? Well, everybody is knocking on the door of Vanguard, knocking on the door of their SIP knocking on the door of all the different pension providers, knocking on the door of all the different financial institutions in the world saying, when can I get Bitcoin in my retirement account? And they're saying, well, the compliance team is saying no. And they're saying, well, that doesn't make sense anymore because now we've got an ETF. And that ETF is issued by the largest financial institutions in the world. So why don't you ask your compliance team why they're not doing it? And compliance come back and said, here's 15 reasons why we can't do it. And then the customers say, but this, but all of our customers want the Bitcoin ETF. And it goes back and forth. And eventually they capitulate and say, hold on, why don't we offer it before everyone else? And all the registered investment advisors, they come along and say, my client's asking for some Bitcoin. They want some. Why can't you offer it? 
and everybody has to capitulate. Now, this is a steady flow of large, some of the largest pools of money from the wealth management industry in the world coming in through the stock market, which means that they have to buy more Bitcoin. So you've got people protecting themselves from wars, from pandemics, from bank crisis, uh, from all those existential threats that give you the reasons to own it. Then you've got all this money coming in from the stock market, from all the registered investment advisors saying, we want some uncorrelated assets. And then you have the debt markets as well. So the government needs to find new ways of lending and finding people that will borrow. What is another source of that market? Stable coins. And remember, stable coins are built on top of proof of stake networks like Ethereum. So as more people transact in stable coins, it creates more fees that feeds those that are buying, you know, staking their ETH in the proof of stake network and then using their ETH in order to buy some Bitcoin, which creates some pressure. That's what our investors are doing at Bank to the Future. And so they then create Bitcoin demand there. That's what we've been doing for years. And when it, And then now it's moved to, um, so essentially, you've got these networks of stable coins that will eventually be CBDCs that are all decreasing in value because they're getting destroyed by the Ponzi economics of always increasing debt. Those that are in the right side of wealth inequality have the assets. That wealth effect goes in back to the market and perpetuates the debt market again. Then they put more of that into Bitcoin or something like that. And then they want to borrow against their Bitcoin. So that issues more stable coins and they take some of that fiat currency. And that's why Tether, for example, is about to approach $100 billion backed by predominantly US government debt. But when inflation comes along and we have the macro side that we were discussing earlier, if inflation gets out of control, they don't put those interest rates down. So as we covered last week, Tether ends up with higher and higher income from issuing those stable coins and put, getting the money from the government through those coupons in US treasuries. And then they take some of their excess profits and they buy Bitcoin. So now you have got demand coming in every angle. It's coming from those that need self-custody. It's coming from those that want to protect their pensions in the stock market. It's coming from governments that want to borrow more and stablecoin issuers attacking full reserve banking by, sorry, attacking fractional reserve banking, which is why I got into Bitcoin in the first place. I was a part of the monetary reform community before Bitcoin was created and shared how this Ponzi scheme will always get attacked. So that creates instability, which leads to more government debt, which perpetuates the cycle. And eventually, obviously, these fiat currencies um, go through their debt cycles and you end up like with a vastly, you know, like the, the great British pound that's no longer backed by gold or no longer backed by silver and just becomes a fiat currency in the abyss of destroying everybody's wealth and creating more and more debt. But now we've got this lovely cycle of self-custody, uh, equity markets, debt markets, all perpetuating into the Bitcoin narratives. And then they're being issued on proof of stake networks, which can allow people to get some more Bitcoin. Um, and that's what the, the different types of trends that, uh, that you can see. And I believe that all of those combined is what is driving a steady flow of new fiat currency that is going down and down in value as Bitcoin is going up and up in value. And as it goes up in value, more people are willing to mine. And as more people are willing to mine, the network gets more secure through proof of work network. And as the network gets more secure, it means that there is more money to invest in renewable energy and incredible innovation. For example, TerraWolf, one of the publicly traded Bitcoin miners, they're now using nuclear power to significantly reduce their cost to mining Bitcoin by having electricity through nuclear power plants. So while nuclear is being used in the proof of weapons network in order to create more and more nuclear bombs and nuclear funding, I covered in last week's broadcast in Bitcoin Hard Talk episode 20, we're in the proof of work network 
gradually, as our market cap increases, investing more in using nuclear in order to get cheaper electricity so that those in the electricity grids can use Bitcoin to use more and more renewable energy and a way of using some of the ele excess electricity in the countries that can generate Bitcoins at the cheapest rate, which eventually can be countries most destroyed by the fiat currency networks, whether it be some of the African nations that can use solar energy and renewable energy, whether it goes up in space and we start to create new interesting technological innovation, uh, whether it be those that are mining it because they're in an insulated economy, we end up with innovation at the fringes as a result of this Austrian economic experiment called Bitcoin. And so Terra Wolf actually have almost 8,000 rigs mined on nuclear power at the moment, significantly cheaper than those that are generating electricity in other ways. And so just so you know, so you can understand some of these geopolitical trends, it's useful to know how much proof of weapon is behind some of the different geopolitical powers, because they are all getting into Bitcoin mining on the sovereign level as well. And so if you look at where all the proof of work is happening, you've got a large amount of it that's happening in America due to many of these public companies. Prior to that, it was a lot in China. That went down as they went through a crackdown. That moved a bunch of it over to Iran, Russia, various other countries that are looking to create more insulated, hard money proof of wealth um, using proof of work. So, But obviously, the largest proof of work network is the proof of weapons network, sorry, is between the two tensions that we are seeing all of the NATO escalations right now, which is obviously Russia on the BRICS layer with China's diplomacy, Russia's nucle nuclear might versus America and NATO and that, uh, you know, by uh, that type of geopolitical power. So I just wanted to give, because um, yesterday, uh, not yesterday, last week, I covered a lot about the different proof of weapons, network, nuclear power. I wanted to give some numbers because I tweeted this out. Essentially, in terms of uh, what nuclear uh, weapons are powering the different proof of weapons network, the largest one, um, by reported, and you know people also don't report these things. Uh, just before I go through that, and then we close it all off and come and put this all together, um, I'm going to be doing an AMA after this. So if you are a member of the Bitcoin Hard Talk membership portal and you have a username and login, it's completely free. Go to simondixon.com. Shortly after this, you will receive an email. Here you go. Hit that yellow button um, and you can, uh, you can sign up. You can get yourself a username and password there. And if you have a username and password, you'll get access to all the things, but you'll also receive an email that will give you an invitation to the webinar AMA. And that's where uh, last week we did our first one. Um, you can ask me questions. You can come on live and uh, we'll do, I'll answer as many of your questions as you can. As long as you've got a login, you'll receive an email shortly after this. Okay, so um, what is backing these military industrial complexes? Well, Russia has approximately 6,000 nukes backing the Russian proof of weapons network. According to the US, it's 5,244 backing it. So those are the two nuclear superpowers. According to China's data, it's only 410. So you've got these two nuclear powers, which is the NATO and BRICS um, corridors. And then you've got the countries that engage in it and has to have them for defensive purposes. So China's only 410 nukes. France is 290. The UK has 225. Uh, Pakistan has 170. So, you know, when these are these political tensions escalate, these are nuclear powers. India has 164. And Israel's not meant to have any, but they've got 90, according to um, the sources um, that, uh, that publish this data as well. Um, that is in direct violation of the agreements between the nuclear powers that we covered last week. And finally, North Korea, um, they have 30 of their own, um, and they are currently having a tit-for-tat with South Korea um, as a re result of those unresolved issues, um, which obviously more favorably South Korea 
would be more favorable on the NATO side of the geopolitical warfare as well and proof of weapons networks. Okay, so what happens anyway? So I've covered these trends in the debt market. Essentially, as more and more people deposit dollars because the user experience of money is getting worse and worse and worse, and you deposit dollars and end up with a stable coin, that stable coin ends up minting new stable coins. The largest one is USDT. Full disclosure, I'm a shareholder in Bitfinex through Bank to the Future. I'm also a shareholder in Circle that mints the second largest um, stable coin, USDC. I'm also a shareholder in Coinbase, um, which has a partnership with USDC. I always like to disclose those. Um, but USDC is the step, second largest stable coin. Um, they end up purchasing treasuries. When they purchase treasuries, they receive yield. That means if they have a strategy of buying Bitcoin with excess profits, that creates a new inflow. And they also reinvest some of that into Bitcoin mining in areas like um, that have been destroyed by the US dollar proof of weapons network, like El Salvador and various other jurisdictions that then make Bitcoin legal tender um, as they go into more dollarized or BRICS type of monetary renegotiations, depending on where the escalations. And this transforms electricity into more and more efficient. And this directly costs and is way more efficient than the central bank proof of weapons network that lead to more and more conflict, Ponzi schemes, destruction of financial systems, inflation, wealth inequality, depending on which side of the proof of weapon network you end up on. Now, as interest rates get higher in order to combat inflation, you end up with more profit to the stable coin issuers, which means that the rates that the governments have to pay in order to lend to stable coin issuers tend to go up in order to meet their Ponzi economics. If they then go for a more of a QE instead of a QT, the rates go down and that pumps the stock markets into the Bitcoin ETFs as people start to go for risk off assets. So this beautiful proof of work network that was Austrian economics on chain that delivers wealth to the saver and a network wealth effect to those that engage in lower time preference behavior by delaying gratification, by saving rather than trading, by putting saving back into the economy, ends up with this beautiful exit strategy that every individual, every country, every company, and even every central bank can engage in as the best CBDCs, as we roll up those oppressed networks, will have some Bitcoin backing if they are smart and want to get traction in a world where it doesn't matter where you're born. You will pick your currency based upon ideological alignment as we enter into this Bitcoin and CBDC world. That means that you get to buy more bonds as rates go up. That exposes the banking system. The banking system has runs on banks because there's $680 billion of Ponzi loans from the Fed that expires in March 2024 has to either be recycled. And then instead of bailing out a bank, why not just say that bank's gone unless JP Morgan wants to buy all the banks and end up with one financial institution, you could just issue a central bank digital currency in proportion and not back it by debt and therefore replace everyone's bank deposit. And do you think you're going to sign up to all the terms and conditions of a CBDC? That's why every country is going to be here in the world, because these are the trends and these are the technologies that's going to be used instead of rolling over Ponzi economic. That creates runs on banks um, and they will always be bailed out with a CBDC, which is why I go back to my original phrase, which I've always said on simondixon.com, prepare yourself for a Bitcoin and CBDC world, because every single day, capitalist countries are looking more and more communist and communist countries are looking more and more capitalist and they meet in the middle of a CBDC and those CBDCs can either be freedom orientated or oppression orientated and we all get to choose. 
but we also have the exit, which creates that ideal tension and artificial intelligence probably ends up doing it in a better way. And we're seeing that roll out in real time. And I always want to make sure that you are ahead of these trends, which is why I see over the long term, the four year cycle, not the short term traders, the market market cap of Bitcoin eating the market cap of gold, which is about $12 trillion. And the market cap of Bitcoin combined with the market cap of gold will eat fiat currency, which currently has a market cap of approximately 165 trillion. Did I say billion before? So we're over a billion dollars for Bitcoin. We're over 12 trillion for Bitcoin above gold, uh, above the ground for gold, and 165 trillion for the combination of all the fiat currencies at the moment. Um, and that is what I think is driving Bitcoin dominance. And then all the intersections that goes into the wider crypto market and the wider proof of weapons network. And so that's what I expect to see. Um, and as always, just before we close up, we're going to be doing an AMA. So you can head over to simondixon.com if you don't have a login right now. Create your login, press that button, and uh, we're going to launch in approximately five minutes. Uh, where we're going to go live. And if you'd like to ask me any questions, we had this format last week. You can join me live and uh, we'll get started over on the live AMA. So always remember, you are alive at one of the most interesting and exciting times in financial history. Some are going to get wrecked. Others are going to do really well. And I want to make sure that you're on the right side of that range because there is no excuses now. Every individual, every country, every company that can find themselves in a position where they have an income, they can spend less than they earn, they can invest the difference in savings like Bitcoin, they can go a bit more speculative to try and generate more Bitcoin as they go into investing, and then you can contribute to the world for those that don't have the same privileges as you do to try and rebuild countries and economies as we enter into this vastly changing world that I'd like the Bitcoin way, the world to be doing with peace, love and unity so that it eats away at the fiat currency proof of weapons network. And we end up with a peaceful type of place, but I think you'll still get continuation of the proof of weapons network, but we can voluntarily exit and we can stand against our governments and we can choose our currencies based upon ideological alignment as we move into this next phase. And that's going to do it for episode 21 of Bitcoin Hard Talk. I will be back this time next week for Bitcoin Hard Talk episode 22. And I'm going to go over to the webinar and do an AMA and answer some of your questions for members of the Bitcoin Hard Talk membership portal. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you would like to see in future episodes. And we'll back this up in case like last week, it ends up getting taken down for review. We'll back it up in the Bitcoin Hard Talk membership portal with all the other resources we have for you there. Peace.